Uh, Bert Folsom is a historian of Hillsdale College and is the longest serving faculty member of Young America's Foundation student programs, where he consistently receives top ratings from young people he reaches through YAF events. Dr. Folsom is a, is a native to Lincoln, Nebraska, and received his BA from U Indiana University, his master's from University of Nebraska, and his PhD from University of Pittsburgh. Over the four decades, Dr. Folsom has taught US history at Murray State University, Southern Uni or so Northwood University, and Hillsdale College. He was the Charles King President of History at Hillsdale College from 2003 to 2017. Last year, he was appointed Distinguished Fellow at Hillsdale College. His two favorite courses that he taught were History of American Presidency and the History of American Economy. Dr. Folsom has written several books, including one of which is front of you, uh, called The Myth of the Robber Barons, uh, published by Young Americans Foundation. Uh, he has also written New Deal or Raw Deal, published by Simon & Schuster in 2008, FDR Goes to War, co-authored by Anita Folsom, published by Simon & Schuster in 2011, and Uncle Sam Can't, Harper, published by HarperCollins in 2014. Dr. Folsom appears frequently as a guest on Fox News, especially with Neil Cavuto. You can find his newest uh, criticism of the top history, of the to uh, top history text, The American Pageant, uh, to learn more, go to www.trueamericanhistory.us. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Folsom. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Connor. Good to be with you all today. Refreshed. I have a question for you right off. How many of you have communicated in some way with somebody more than 50 miles from Santa Barbara here today already at 9 in the morning. Gosh, it looks like most of you. How many have communicated with somebody out of state, out of the state of Colorado or, or California? <laughs> in Colorado, <laughs> maybe some. Uh, in uh, another country. Look at this. Well, you've been busy. As, as, as we all sometimes are on our iPhone here, if you look at this invention, you know, I know you're saying, oh yeah, I mean Apple, it's a private, privately invented device, sure, and uh, all the investment, the money, Steve Jobs and Apple went into putting this together, and it was a sensation 10 years ago, and now it's a part of our lives, and all of that research, they didn't know if they could do it, they, put all so many of their top people into this, so much money, millions of dollars into it, and before they ever made a cent. And then finally they produce it, and it's a big hit. What you may not know, if you go back to the origins of what is now the iPhone, way, way back, it was originally, in the United States, a socialist industry. Let me pursue that more specifically. What's the first invention that allows us to be able to say, yes, I communicated with somebody 20 miles away five minutes ago? It's what? Telegraph. telegraph. Yeah, the telegraph. The telegraph. Does anybody know who invented it? <laughs> Bill invents the telephone. But the telegraph, the previous generation, Samuel Morse, Morse code, dot dash, dot dot dot, dash dash dash, dot dot dot, SOS, save our ship. He invented the Morse code. What he discovered was that you could take a wire, he discovered this, you have a long wire, and you hit the wire, and the impulse would go on that wire for a long way, and there were things you could put on the wire that would make the impulse travel, keep traveling. And that gave him the idea. You could communicate by, by having letters like dot, dot, dot is the letter S, three dots. One dot is the letter E, uh, letter e. And then some letters are more complicated. Dot, dot, dash, dot is the letter F. 
And so you have a complicated, and then you have a space in between, and you could put impulses, tap on that wire, and then if you had the wire, like a telegraph wire, it'd be now like a telephone wires, so if you had that extending, you could hit that, and you could communicate with somebody miles away. He invented it, a private invention. As he invented it, though, he thought, this is so powerful. For the first time in human history, being able to co communicate with somebody that far back and, and that far away so instantly, it is so transforming for human history. I'm not sure we can trust private enterprise, number one, to even do it. I mean, he did invent it, but I mean to actually execute it and make it a workable operation, a business. And I'm not even sure we want to because, I mean, people might send weird stuff and you might need to have all that regulated. This was a debate that we had in the 1840s. And Morse, the very inventor, thought, you know what, this ought to be a government enterprise. And the U.S. government agreed and they built the first telegraph wire from Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, 40 miles north to Baltimore. It was a 40-mile wire. They put it above ground, and then they got an office. So somebody is going to be in an office in Washington, D.C., and is going to learn the Morse code, and he'll be doing the dots and the dashes. You'll have people who come in, and they pay to send a telegram and you pay, in today's money, it's over a dollar a word. It was less than that, but purchasing power. Today, we, it would be more over. And so that's why telegrams are short. Yeah. Tim, come home now. You know, those kinds of things. So you're, you're not going to be verbose as we sometimes are on our emails. You, you, it's, you're charged by the word. So you had that, and you, so you had uh, 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 an office in Washington, D.C. And what, in the debate, by the way, there were, the debate, the Postmaster General, I need to quote this before I get into the operation. The Postmaster General, Cave Johnson, in 1845, the first year of our operating telegraph, so it's 170 some years ago, he said, the telegraph is so powerful for good or evil. It is so powerful for good or evil that it cannot with safety to the people be left in the hands of private individuals. See? The telegraph is so powerful for good or evil it cannot with safety to the people be left in the hands of private individuals. You can't have private enterprise. Now, this is interesting because many of you know what Ronald Reagan said. We're now in 1840. We're 50 years, almost 50, 40-some years, yeah, 50 years, past the, the uh, Constitution and the beginning of our country. And the, the founders have just all died as of a couple years ago. And Ronald Reagan said, and you've heard this already, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on to them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. A government-owned enterprise was the farthest thing from the founders' mind, and Article 1, Section 8 has a very limited role for the federal government. But we thought that this would be an exception, and we kind of allowed it because, hey, you can, it's like delivering the mail, which the federal government can be involved with. I mean, telegrams are like, sort of like a mail, and therefore it can fall under that provision. Therefore, maybe it becomes a constitutional, constitutionally proper to do a telegraph. 
So this is, we're, we're going to make an exception. And notice, we're one generation away from the founders. You get one generation away, and already you've got this socialist experiment. The entire communications, long-distance communications, is a socialist enterprise. It is owned by the government. The profits are made by the government. The losses are taken by the government. All of this is going to be a private enterprise. And so the question, I think it's very important to ask, I mean, as a historian, history teacher, what happened? What were the results with this government enterprise, with this socialist enterprise? Socialism, it's force. It is uh, control of an economic endeavor by the government. Now, of course, our whole economy is not in any way socialized. It's just this one new industry that's socialized. This is an experiment in the United States right after the founders are gone <coughs> Apparently, we didn't pass the freedom on in the bloodstream, and <laughs> we're having to experiment here and see what happens if we have a socialist ex experiment. So that's the question. We've got, we, we know we have revenue. People come into the telegraph office in DC. In the telegraph office, we have uh, a, a, a secretary there, someone who will take the money. They'll ask you what you want to say in the telegram. They'll charge you the money for it. You have an accountant that will ultimately put this all on the books. Then you have somebody sending the telegram. So you have those, the revenue is what you're charging for the telegrams, so you're going to have revenue coming in. But of course you'll have expenses with the office. The rent on the office, the telegraph itself, and by the way, there'll be breakdowns. Sometimes if a wire breaks, you can't transmit. And so you have to have repair for the wire. So you can see you're going to have some expenses, too. So you're going to have uh, wire expenses. You're going to have to pay the secretary. You're going to have to pay, of course, the, not only the rent, but for the person tent sending the telegram. And then in Baltimore, 40 miles away, you have an office. And you have the same group of people that are taking telegrams and, and sometimes sending them to Washington, D.C. So if you want to hear news from Washington, D.C., what happened? What did politicians do in the Senate today? Then, in, and you're in Baltimore, then you would have somebody you knew in Washington send you what Senator said on the Senate floor or whatever. Or if you had a personal transmission. You know, I have a sister who lives in Baltimore. Tell her I'm coming up for her birthday celebration next week. Telegrams could be a lot of different things. In 1945, we began. We had expenses. We had revenue. It's a government operation. At the end of six months, the revenue and the expenses. Which one do you think was larger, the revenue or the expenses? Expenses. It's interesting. You say the expenses. How many think the expenses? How many think the revenue with this new, yeah. Most of you, by a little margin, think the revenue. The majority is wrong. The expenses. By a margin of six to one. In other words, every dollar we took in from people sending a telegram, we had six dollars of expenses. Now, the Postmaster General, who, you know, he was still saying, you know, they said, what do you think about this? He says, the telegraph is so powerful for good or evil, it cannot with safety to the people be left in the hands of private individuals. And we just started our business. Yeah, all starting businesses take losses at first. People have to get to know we're here. Come on over to sell a telegram, send a telegram. We can have a line form, you get your telegrams in, and we'll make money here. Let's, hey, it's only half the year is over. So then let's look at the second half of the year. The second half of the year, 1845, our first year of a telegraph, the finances came in, the revenue. We had the expenses. The accountant lined it all up and said, there's a change. There's a change. It used to be $6 of expenses and $1 of earnings, revenue. It, there's a change. 
it's now $10 of expenses and $1 of revenue. In other words, if we were bring, for every $100 of telegrams we were sending and making money, $100, we had $1,000 of expenses. My question here, I want you to think about this. This is a failing enterprise, and the postmaster general said, you know what? We're losing money, and we hardly ever have balanced budgets or, or budget deficits, which is true for those days, 1840s. Maybe we can afford to give this to private enterprise so that we're not taking losses anymore. Maybe we can privatize and make the telegraph a private industry. As we were debating this, we had Ezra Cornell start a company called Western Union. He made an offer. We sold the government enterprise, which is socialist enterprise. Now it became a private enterprise. There were other telegraph companies who started too. But the biggest one was going to be Western Union, started by Ezra Cornell, a guy who didn't have a college education. But he helped set up the original telegraph wire. And he thought a lot about telegraphs. And he's going to take it over. And I'm going to talk about him because he's going to make it incredibly successful. But before I get into this, I want to stop just a minute. Why was the government unsuccessful with its socialist enterprise? Why, why could they not make money? Because we can, all, we can all see how you make money on this. People are going to want to communicate. Why did they take losses? And then increasing losses over time. Help me with this. Yeah. Why couldn't they make a success of it? Uh, incentives. Speak up. Uh, in the private market, you, uh, you get the money you make is depends on how well your product does, so you want to continuously make it better. Yeah. In the private market, you want to make it better. But wouldn't you want to make it better in the government market too? I mean, as a socialist enterprise, and let's say you're the guy running the telegraph or the accountant, wouldn't they want that to be better too? But they don't get paid the same. Yeah. How does that work? They don't get paid the same? The government just gets them the same, everyone the same check. They give everyone the same salary. Yeah. Whereas Ezra Cornell at Western Union, his check is dependent on how much business he can drum up, right? Yeah. That's very good. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Right, and, and it's true. Some of these people said, boy, I'm working so hard, I need a raise. So sometimes expenses a little bit on that go up, even without corruption. Uh, the incentive argument, which, what's your name? Donnie Roberts. Donnie. The incentive argument that Donnie was, was telling us about is real. Ezra Cornell was ultimately going to become a millionaire, and the government company went broke, even though the government company had college-educated people running this, and here's some guy who never, you know, it, it seems kind of remarkable, but the incentives play a huge role. Let me ask you this. Would it make any difference, would it make any difference in your, uh, study habits. If we didn't have grades A, B, C, D, F, it's just, hey, we want you to learn and just go out there and learn, okay? Would, would that have any bearing on how much you study for your courses? Yes. <laughs> it has bearing, you're saying. That's why we have grades, is because it provides an incentive for you to get out there and work. Now, I know you're sitting there. My teacher's up there telling me all these incentives and are very, very important. I have incentives. I had a colleague I taught with, not at Hillsdale College. 
Not at Hillsdale College, which has great faculty, and I mean, they take no federal aid, and they, they run an independent ship. But before I taught there, I taught at a school where I had a colleague, fellow professor, who said, uh, you know, I'm I don't want to go to class today. He just called class, and then he did it. Hey, I, I think I'm going to not go the next time. He was, you know, I'm in my office, and I, oh, gosh, I have to get up there and do that lecture. And the chairman finally called him in and threatened to fire him. And you know what? He was there teaching every class for the rest of the semester. He, we respond to incentives. You respond to incentives. Ezra Cornell responded to incentives. Let's look at, again at that office in Washington, D.C. That guy sitting there doing telegrams. Now, you almost think of this like a the post office. Uh, they're coming in and you have customers and they do the work to get the mail out. Or he, and he does the telegram. Think of it this way. And Donnie made the good point. They're, they're paid a salary. Do you want people in a long line doing telegrams? Does that make your day? Or would you rather have nobody there or very few people there? Ah, you can read the paper, catch up on the Washington Post, chit chat with some of the people in the room. Oh no, here's a customer. I found this one time when I was doing research on entrepreneurs. I came into a historical society and uh, they told me, oh yeah, I asked to see the papers of a certain politician. And they said, this guy will know where they are. And I went over and said, I'd like to speak to, to Mr. Haynes, you know, the guy. And, and Haynes was over there. They showed me who he was. And he quick leaned over and was hiding behind a pillar. And so I said, Mr. Haynes. So he, you know, it was. Would you show me? And then, you know, oh, see, you know, I, bought, I interrupted his day. If you're there at the telegraph office, you're happy if there are only three customers that day. If there are 50 customers, you come home and you say to your wife, I was working all day and they were just up there, just one after another. I was sitting there, dots and dashes. And, oh, I hear it in my head. And so he wasn't so happy. In other words, the incentives as Donnie said, are just simply not properly in place. Now you look at Ezra Cornell. Ezra Cornell bought this thing and the government thought, oh, we dropped this whole business on this, this chump. He just bought this business that we couldn't make any money on. <laughs> Ezra Cornell came in there and immediately he's got this telegraph and he says, we're going to have, uh, if you want to know the latest news from the Capitol in politics, uh, you can call in, of course, that, or you can do a telegram. Of course, that existed before. But he said, how about weather reports? How about to the police department? If there's a criminal who's leaving north, you can tell the Baltimore people about it. Connect the police departments and have them send telegrams to one another. Steamship companies talk about the weather. You know, you can talk about the weather in Baltimore and Washington. You can do that. And then he immediately, before he'd made any profit, really, he borrowed capital took the risk, and he had to borrow at a high percent of interest, Ezra Cornell did. And he extended the telegraph to New York. So it now goes Washington, Baltimore, New York. And the people of the government were laughing. We couldn't make money with this thing when it was 40 miles, and he more than doubles the length. Look at the debt he's accumulating. Then he got it to Washington, he cut, or to New York, he cut the rates so that more people would want to send telegrams. And then he said, how many of you would like to know stock prices up to date to buy and sell instantly from accounts that you can have in New York, even though you're living in Baltimore or Washington, D.C.? New York is the financial center of the United States, and Washington's the political center. I have connected the political center and the economic center, and information can go back and forth. All of a sudden, the telegraph was booming. Plus, he had all these people who lived in New York. He was inducing them to ha running advertisements. Communicate with your friends and your relatives in Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Advertising was helping. When that was successful and began to make a big profit, he expanded all across the country. In 19 1852, 
Seven years after, or six years after he bought, he, the government had the telegraph. It was socialist in 1845. By 1852, Ezra Cornell had 23,000 miles of telegraph wire. 23,000. And the private enterprise was going. In the 1860s, the telegraph made it out here to California. <laughs> It was all over the United States so that people in San Francisco and Los Angeles could communicate with stockbrokers via, by the way, of Telegram in New York. Then we had a wrapped underground telegraph wire uh, that were, I should say, on top of the ocean telegraph wire, right on the bottom of the ocean, but in the ocean, that we did to England, 1870. We did that. So now the Prime Minister of England could communicate with the President of the United States. And as somebody said in 1870 when they made their first communications, if we could have done this 60 years ago, we could have prevented the War of 1812, where England and the U.S. fought. That's true, they could have, because the diplomats were working toward a peace treaty, but the ships got started to declare war back and forth right when the diplomats were organizing for peace. Sixty years earlier, if we'd had that telegraph, we wouldn't have had a war. But in 1870, we had it, the telegraph. We could communicate now across continents. In one year, the socialist enterprise went broke. Twenty-five years later, the telegraph is all over the country and all over the world. It was a huge demonstration effect. Now, you have in your book a story of James J. Hill and the Transcontinentals. Those people who liked the idea of socialism said, I have one more idea. <laughs> How about a sort of a socialized long-distance road? Railroads are private enterprises. But how about a long transcontinental railroad and make that government operate? And so we had that. We had, now President Lincoln was behind it. He thought, we need this to connect California with the rest of the nation. And the Union Pacific and Central Pacific were part of that first transcontinental. Chapter two of your book that I wrote there on James J. Hill tells that story. Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was behind this. I regret to say this because in many ways he did some good things as president. But he did say this to the president of the Union Pacific Railroad. We were gonna pay so much per mile all across the nation and the Central Pacific was, gonna, it was in California, and it was going to go west. And the Union Pacific was in Omaha, Nebraska, and it was going to go west. And they were going to meet, and they met in Utah. <sighs> president Lincoln said to Granville Dodge, the president of the Union Pacific, quote, if the subsidy money is not enough, ask double, and you shall have it. If the money is not enough, ask double, and you shall have it. Boy, what could go wrong with that? Well, get, for, this, for this government operated line, ask double if you need it. Well, they asked for double. And they got a lot of it. And they spent, our national debt at the time was $60 million. And at the end of the disaster of the first transcontinental, we doubled our national debt, 60 million to build that. And you'd say, there, well, how could you not, how could you lose money on the transcontinental? Oh, I said they're paying by the mile, right? Okay, they're in Nebraska. They're being paid by the mile to go out to California. California's here, Nebraska. Well, we're paid by the mile, right? My goodness, it took them forever and a day to get out of Nebraska. There wasn't a town practically in Nebraska that wasn't hit by a transcontinental railroad. And finally, they, they got out of there and they were so sad when they got to Colorado because there were mountains. And then they thought, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, a mountain, though, goes like this and this. Instead of searching for the lowest grade, they just thought, uh-oh, we need to get here through through the mountain area quickly so we can uh, quick get to the other side and make more money. So they did not have a good grade up the mountain, which is hard for a train to go uphill, and they didn't do a good job with that. 
They finally get over the mountain. Now the Union Pacific and Central Pacific, they both get federal subsidies and they're coming together. Here they come. And we had the invention of dynamite. And the Union Pacific could have written a book called Dy Dynamite's good for blowing up mountainous areas, making it flat so the railroad can run on a flat grade. The Union Pacific could have written a book, Dynamite, Its Uses and Abuses. The use, of course, is blowing up the mountainous area to get a level terrain. The abuse is when you sneak over in the middle of the night to the Central Pacific's railroad, blow it up, and then say they didn't get any mileage for that because they, they don't get money for the miles they built because those miles of rail don't exist anymore. Yeah. Gee, I wonder what the Central Pacific did about that. Why? This is a tough one with students. What did the Central Pacific do? A, yeah, A, they turned the other cheek. B, they said, oh, shucks. C, they bought their own dynamite. <laughs> they went over to the Union Pacific Railroad in the middle of the night. Or maybe it was one hour after so that they wouldn't run into the Union Pacific people who were also running around in the middle of the night. They went over to the Union Pacific Road, and you heard a big boom. And that was the end of the Union Pacific Rails. How many think it's A, they turned the other cheek? B, they said, oh, shucks. C, they bought their own dynamite. <laughs> Incentives in human nature are out there sometimes, aren't they? Yes, they did. And then Congress had to get involved and say, no, you're taking our subsidy money and you're buying dynamite and blowing each other up. <laughs> Don't do that. Oh, we won't give you anything more. No, 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 no. So they had to quit. Now they're going to have to meet. And they go in like this. <laughs> they parallel each other. Both of them claiming money for the mileage they refused to meet. So Congress has to say, you will meet at Promontory Point or else nobody gets a penny beyond Promontory Point, Utah. So they meet at Utah. They spent all of that money. And then uh, it, the money was lost because nobody could go from Omaha to California on the Transcontinental because you couldn't get through the mountainous area on the road they built. So it went into bankruptcy, it had to be resold. That money was lost to the federal government. Finally, James J. Hill, who's the hero of the Chapter 2 in Myth of the Robber Barons, he built a private enterprise Transcontinental. He was inspired by people like Samuel or, or, or like uh, Ezra Cornell. It's, it became a private enterprise. The private line was successful. He built it out west, made the industries profitable. He built it from Minnesota, St. Paul, to Seattle, Washington. Do we have anybody from Seattle here? Do they talk about James J. Hill? Uh, I haven't been there for a while, but I used to live in Seattle. Oh, in Seattle. Okay, is somebody uh, maybe in Seattle now? Where, yeah, do they talk about James J. Hill? No, <laughs> he's a hero. I'm glad we, we, we have the book Myth of the Robber Baron because he's a hero. He moved to Seattle. He, he sold land to Frederick Weyerhaeuser and they got the timber industry going. See, he made money he, in the copper industry in Montana, timber in Seattle. He, he thought, hey, to build a success, successful rail, railroad, you have to have business. So he tried to get business going all along the railroad and did so. And so Hill, who was an immigrant, and didn't start with much money, ended up being the successful railroad operator. All of these successes, we, we ended up in the period after the Civil War saying, look, the United States may become a great country. We may flop and never surpass England. England was a, ahead of the United States in industry. So was Germany. We said, those European countries may be ahead of us forever. Whether they stay ahead of us or not, we've learned our lesson. They were practicing what Ronald Reagan would later say when he said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We're the generation after the founders who learned about freedom and what works and what doesn't. And we're going to have our own private enterprise. We're going to have limited government. And you had the most colossal growth 
of private enterprise after the Civil War. In that generation, it was just amazing. For example, some of you already mentioned the telephone. The telegraph finally went all the way to Europe. And then the telephone is going to be invented by Alexander Graham Bell. Somebody was mentioning that. And President Rutherford B. Hayes was there at the famous uh, inventors gathering where he said it, he was the first president to talk on the phone. And there's a picture sometimes of Rutherford B. Hayes with a telephone in his ear and he's smiling. I think he's smiling because the call he received was not a telemarketer. But in any case, he's smiling. You have the invention of the telephone in the 1860s. You have other inventions that come in. Uh, you have uh, the invention of the automobile, the car. You have electricity. Thomas Edison and Henry Ford. What are some of Edison's inventions besides electricity? He discovered electricity. He, he, uh, he discovered, yeah, the light bulb. Motion pictures, movies, yeah. And the phonograph. Yeah, yeah, alternating current. He had over a, a thousand patents. When Edison went to school, his teachers at public schools said to his mother, they wrote a letter to his mother and told Edison to bring it to his mother and make sure she read it. And the letter said, your son Thomas is addled. Addled meaning mentally ill. We do not want to try to teach him anymore. She said, well, he doesn't do too well at the government schools. Uh, how about homeschool? So she homeschooled him. And he always said later in life, I may be the greatest inventor of my generation, maybe, but one thing's for sure, my mother is the hero of my life because she gave me the chance and told me that I was really good and that we we're going to stay at home because I was, she, she called him a genius as a young, he was, she had seven kids in her family. Thomas, you're a genius. We're just going to train you at home. She spoke positively over his life. He has those marvelous inventions. He's discovering electricity. He's, uh, he's, he's working that and, and the, the lighting. I mean, look at what we enjoy from Thomas Edison. Henry Ford, obviously, the automobile. What, uh, those two were friends. Edison and Ford were friends. Ford worked for Edison for a while and then worked on his car in his spare time. Henry Ford and Thomas Edison would often go out and eat together. Can you imagine you're going out there and, oh, we're going out to Enterprise Fish Mark to, you know, for breakfast. Hey, there are Edison and Ford over there, you know. You're, you're, you're sitting there, wow, you know, look, look, there, there they are. But there were funny things that would sometimes happen because Henry Ford, if he liked someone, he was eccentric. I mean, he wouldn't eat chicken because, and they said, why won't you eat chicken? He said, because chickens eat bugs. I mean, so you've got, but, but see, it takes that sometimes, that entrepreneurial mind sometimes. Where he, if, he, if he liked somebody, he'd <laughs> give him a kick in the pants. And there's a story. They went to a posh New York hotel, and Ford and Edison were there, and I could just see all the people. <laughs> there they are. There they are. And all of a sudden, Ford sneaked over and went, boom. Gave Edison a kick, and Edison turned around and kicked Ford back. They, they created so much commotion, they broke the chandelier that was over their table. <laughs> I'm not saying that entrepreneurs can't be eccentric and a little odd, but we were open to this creative genius, and those two people the, with the automobile, incredible. And look at the gasoline. Yeah, Ford would hire, Ford would hire Women, men, handicapped people, blacks. He had, for, for handicapped people, he'd have hospitals where he'd have nuts and bolts, and they'd be screwing nuts and bolts as part of a mini assembly line there in the hospital. He wanted to give everybody a chance. There was a homeless person on the way to work in Michigan when he was driving. He picked him up and gave him a job. And he did that a couple times, and he said some of them came back and said, I don't want to do this, it's hard. But he would give people chances. 
gasoline, John D. Rockefeller. His oil business, at first it was kerosene for lighting, and then of course electricity, so he goes into gas, uh, gas. And you've got the first and second billionaires in US history, John D. Rockefeller in oil, Standard Oil, and Henry Ford in automobile. The best in our, the best entrepreneurs, at least measured in dollar earnings. Rockefeller said he was a strong Christian, so he gave, he was constantly giving to churches and he was giving to solve problems like the boll weevil problem that was hurting the cotton crop in the South, medical meningitis he was solving. He'd give to black colleges. Uh, he said, the smartest thing I ever did was make Jesus my savior. The second smartest thing I ever did was make Laura Spellman my wife. And he named a college after his wife, Spelman College in Atlanta. Does anybody know what Spelman College was serving? It was, yes, uh, it, but women, uh, black women. Historically, it's a... a it is. See, he was giving money to Tuskegee Institute, which Booker T. Washington started. And then he thought, that's men. What about women? Women had to have a chance, too, for black women. So he set up Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, for black women. There were only one black college before 1860. Entrepreneurs, primarily, and others, uh, set up dozens of colleges so that we had 100 black colleges. According to the US Census, the illiteracy rate for black Americans was the liter I mean, only one out of every five was literate. Under one out of five was 19%. By 1930, in a time of no government advantage to being African American, uh, the literacy rate was 84%. And a lot of this was teachers being educated at Spelman College, Tuskegee, and other black schools. Hampton Institute in uh, Virginia and many others going out and educating. And John D. Rockefeller and the entrepreneurs were behind that. So you, what I'm saying is you have here not only the United States rising to greatness. We thought, hey, we've got to get the federal government out of business after business. And that's exactly what we did. We go from national debt from $3 billion after the Civil War to $1 billion by 1900. We cut two-thirds of the national debt off. We eliminated the income tax. We had a progressive income tax in the Civil War. We eliminated the whole thing in the 1870s. So we were just making money on tariffs and the sale of land, but the thing is the federal government was so small because private enterprise came in to do so many functions. The starting of orphanages, universities, Cornell University, Ezra Cornell, Vanderbilt University, Cornelius Vanderbilt in railroads and steamships, Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. for the deaf, started by Alexander Graham Bell. These entrepreneurs were working to help elevate people who didn't have advantages, and the United States was soaring into world leadership we have the invention of the typewriter by an American, the invention of the adding machine in the 1880s by an American. Imagine how that helps business. One other, and I'm final, I'm almost done. We have the invention of the first computer in 1890 by Herman Hollerith, and he said, I could never have done it without the typewriter and the adding machine. What he did was he had cards well, I need to explain first. There's a, there's a back story here, I have to just say. He worked for the U.S. Census Bureau in 1880, and it took them all 10 years to get the census done, because at that time they didn't have an adding machine, and they were having to compute all that census information for 60, 60 million, million Americans, and they were putting all that together, and it took, when you had to do all that by hand, it took all the 10 years. And then 
the, the head of the, the Josh Billings, uh, who was the head, John Billings, the, oh, wait a minute, let me get his name right here. Uh, John Billings, who was head of that. John Billings was always nervous. How, what are we going to do the next year when we have more people? Herman Hollerith worked in the Census Bureau and is the computer invention guy. He wanted to date Billings' daughter, Kate. And he had dates with Kate, and she said, but you got to come home. Dad wants to see you for dinner. So he's coming over there, and the dad is sitting there, boy, what we need is somebody who can invent something that will make it easier for us to do the U.S. Census. We need an entrepreneur to invent something. And Kate is right there. He says, well, maybe I can do it. <laughs> You know, trying to impress your girlfriend in front of her father. Maybe I can do it. <laughs> he said, Herman, you're just the man. I look for you to do that. And Kate was all impressed. Now, <laughs> what Kate needed to realize was he wasn't going to do it the next day. It was going to take a while. And what Herman needed to realize is, because it's going to take so long, you need to give some attention to Kate and not be spending full time with your invention. The relationship ended, going, ended up going south. Kate ended up marrying someone else while he's still working on his invention. But the dad was impressed because he got it invented. He had these computer cards that look, I mean, about this size, and you'd punch in, male or female. They'd have here, and you'd punch in, male or female. And then you'd have your age, where you came from, your occupation. All of that was on here. So then they would take all of this information they collected and put it on a card. Then they would stick the cards in what we would call a primitive computer. It would tabulate. See, we had the adding machine by then. It would tabulate all this. And we did the 1890 census in about two or three years. An incredible invention. He's the forerunner, Herman Hollerith, of IBM, International Business Machines. Was founded off of his company in 1924, years later. Now, I say that to this. Capitalism was absolutely paramount. It was a free society. It gave us all of these items that we have. Today that we enjoy the automobile electricity. Uh, and furthermore, they set the stage for the United States. The United States had just surged ahead of all the other European countries. Our standard of living was now on top by 1900. Plus, they set the way for the next generation. The automobile is now an American invention and product. Ford and, G and General Motors are going to surge to keeping the United States on top during the first part of the 1900s. The second part of the 1900s, the computers are the big business. And we had the forerunners of that in the late 1800s, too, with Herman Hollerith. So what we have here is an America under a freedom, a system of freedom, and that system of freedom produced economic growth. It produced low unemployment. We had universities being created. Government expenses were low. We eliminated two-thirds of the national debt. As Ronald Reagan said, freedom is not passed on in the bloodstream. In this case, we had to learn the hard way with a government enterprise that failed, the telegraph. We turned around when it was privatized. It was successful. We decide, with the, the railroads, we decided, needed to be private because the transcontinentals worked better private. We said all of it is going to be private, limited government, massive economic development, almost a million immigrants a year coming over here to the United States, a new land, and then they in turn create industries that make this a great nation. What we had here is an example, socialism versus capitalism in history. We made a decision in the 1800s. The founders were right. We tried the dark side <laughs> for a year with the telegraph. We tried it a little bit with the transcontinentals. Private enterprise works. We're sticking with the Constitution. The United States soars to top economic development. Thank you.
good. Let's have some questions. All right, we're going to start with one of our questions from the virtual pass. OK. This question is from Holly Breyer from Stowe, Vermont. The question is, do you believe it is ever OK for the government to help with infrastructure? Holly's asking government help with infrastructure. Uh, in theory, uh, perhaps, but what I'm saying, is, again, is what works and what doesn't work. Uh, sometimes states can have some infrastructure if it's done at the state level. But what we have, when we have the federal government trying to do in infrastructure, it often is a disaster. The railroads are a good example. Railroads are infrastructure and are, uh, are an incredible disaster. Uh, often what happens is, in the United States, when you have good entrepreneurs creating enterprises, the infrastructure is done privately. Let's say you have two cities Entrepreneurs are successful here and here. You don't need a government to connect the two with a railroad or with some kind of telephone communication, all of that. Private enterprises emerge. There's a big city here, a big city here. Markets will emerge, and you can have the infrastructure done privately. So I would say, in theory, but in practice, privately executed infrastructure seems to work much better. Thank you for your question, Holly. Hi there. Hello. <laughs> Give me your name and where you... Uh, my name is Jane. I'm from Provo, Utah. Okay. I go to Provo High School. Good. Uh, um, so my question is, um, you talked a lot about Henry Ford and how he was inclusive, but something I'd like to point out is that he was a known anti-Semite. Yeah, he was. And that he would not hire Jews and he was a Hitler sympathizer. So is it right to idolize him for no, inclusiveness? No, I, I, I would never it? idolize him. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, and we see things like this with Ilhan Omar and how people are not condemning anti-Semitism where they see it. Um, and my question is, should we try to separate the work from the artist, or yeah. are they one? I think to some extent you should try, but I think it's important to look at both. Henry Ford's anti-Semitic, he was anti-Semitic, but he did have some Jews on his workforce. He didn't so much mind what he objected to, what got him to be anti-Semitic was bankers. There were many bankers who refused to give him loans when he really needed it. And he was trying to get his assembly line going and his Model T going, and ultimately he did. But there were years where he was living on the edge, and he felt that there were bankers there who were against him. The Jewish bankers were against him because he wasn't Jewish, and they would loan to Jews. That's their privilege. They're a private company, bank. If they want to loan to Jews, they, they ought to. But Henry Ford didn't think that. So it didn't bother him to have Jews on his workforce uh, some. And, and he didn't seem to much. But the, the, the leaders uh, up there, he didn't like. That, and I think Henry Ford also got, remember I called Thomas, that, per, that teacher called Thomas Edison addled? I think Ford became a little addled in the 1930s. He was by that time in his 70s. And he ended up, he had always been anti-union, and all of a sudden he embraced the auto unions. And he just did strange things. He wouldn't, he fired his son. Uh, his son went off to college and became a sociology major. <laughs> you know? I mean, the, he was a strange, he was eccentric. And I think the anti-Semitism is part of that. Uh, no, I, I think that, that needs to be vigorously condemned, his anti-Semitism. I'm just trying to explain why he did that. He still was a great inventor, but he that anti-Semitism is terrible. All right, thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm Donnie Robbins from Camarillo High School. Yes, Donnie, good to ha have you talking again. Go ahead. I'm currently a junior, and I'm taking AP U.S. History, and we're on the progressive era with Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt was a Republican. But I've looked online, and it seems pretty debated whether he's more of a hero or a villain amongst the Republican Party. So I wanted your opinion on him. Uh, yeah, there's a lot about him that's villain. Uh, what I like about him is he was always a good family man. In fact, there were people who'd sit there over the White House, and he'd be out there playing, and his kids would be outside hanging on things in the White House, and he'd be running around playing with them. He was very much a family man, very good with his kids. But he was, he liked government. And he believed government could, he was an example of someone who didn't get the, uh, the, the message about freedom exactly. He went to Harvard. But, but back, back then, Harvard wasn't that socialist. 
But he, he favored a progressive income tax. He favored a, progress, a uh, an inheritance tax, very progressive. And those things make him very much more like a modern-day progressive than someone who was contemporary with the freedom of the late 1800s. Yeah. Uh, by the way, with uh, uh, Connor mentioned my that website, www.trueamericanhistory.us. I look at the textbook, The American Pageant. Are any of you using that book? Look at that. Some of you, right there. It's the most widely used textbook. I, I have a critique of that textbook. Not every line, but a lot of those things, including Theodore Roosevelt. That textbook just loves government intervention and is sometimes very simple sympathetic to socialism. They, and what I do in that textbook is I look at the textbook, the, I take passages, and then I say, well, what they're omitting is this. And then I'll discuss the other side. And so it gives you a chance to see something other than the progressive side of American history. www.trueamericanhistory.us. Thank you, Don. This is a question from Rebecca Addison from Arlington, Virginia. She asks, what are some examples of modern day subsidies that have had the same problems as the railroad subsidies you spoke about? How, yes, the, the question, what about modern subsidies? We still see this. In fact, we see it more than ever. Uh, we, we've had trouble getting over the issue that some, brand, some type of government intervention, perhaps even socialism. So these experiments are still happening. Uh, Amtrak has a lot of failed, the train system, a lot of failed subsidies. They can't operate the trains anymore as efficiently as they used to be able to when they were privately done. The mail, the U.S. mail goes into debt every year. And isn't it interesting that UPS is, it makes money and FedEx make money every year and the post office operated by the government doesn't? Some of the same incentives are in place here that create lack of innovation, and lack of effort there at the post office, you don't see FedEx and UPS quite that way. I think that before this thing is over, I think Elon Musk, Musk is going to have some more problems too. Musk relies on, you know, Elon, he's, he's an interesting character, but ultimately he likes the federal subsidy, and I think with SpaceX and some of these, I th we're in the process of this now, but I think ultimately that will be done privately better too. But those are modern, a few modern examples that are happening today. Thank you for your question. Hi. Thanks for coming. My name's Taylor Dean. I'm from Santa Cruz County in California. Okay. Um, so my question is a little bit interesting. I hear often when I have to talk about socialism and capitalism, I bring up in history class specifically, which we do use the AP pageant textbook. So that's really cool. Thank you They for use that. the American pageant? And then we read Howard Zinn to counteract it. Oh so. my God, <laughs> Howard Zinn is further out. Right? <laughs> yeah, so pretty funny. Um, so we talk about the National Socialist Worker, Worker Party, and then we have people say that that's capitalism, and then people say that that's socialism. Could you explain if there's a difference or what that looks like? No, no, it's, it's socialism. By, by the way, Howard Zinn was a member of the Communist Party. Now, I've got to say this about the American pageant. Those two people, the co-authors there, were not members of the Communist Party. But Zinn was, and Zinn, uh, with Zinn, you almost every page has at least three factual errors. You know, one test of a student is, we'll pull out a random sentence, you, you give me the factual error. Uh, the American pageant's actually a little bit better, but it's still bad enough that we need that study, the, the critique of it that I've done. If you want a critique of the Zen book, by the way, the textbook by Larry Schweikart, which is Patriot's History of the United States, deals with a lot of what the Zen textbook has to say. So I highly recommend Patriot's History of the United States by Larry Schweikart. Uh, but the social, with, with the National Social, the Socialist, you, you, you have their parties and groups that really believed that we would be better off, inter, uh, industrial workers of the world, that we would be better off with socialism. What I find interesting is that the industrial workers of the world 
uh, the head of it, uh, Haywood, went off and ended up in Russia. Uh, you look at the American Federation of Labor. They were racist. They refused to allow blacks in their unions, unlike Rockefeller and, and Ford. Uh, you, you find that there's racist impulses in a lot of socialists, not all of them. But you find, again, the emphasis that problems can be solved by government intervention, and those problems, at least in the late 1800s, that generation said, no, we are following the founders. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> I know Mason. you very well. Good to, <laughs> it's good to, good see, to you. see you. Um, so my question was about uh, net neutrality and how that's becoming a, a huge issue right now, uh, the, especially uh, now. Uh, net neutrality, the uh, the Democrats' proposal over it, and how it, it, you know they they want uh, the network to be, I guess, all equal, like everybody have equal speeds, right? Are we, uh, and they justify this with the interstate commerce clause, so are we falling into another transcontinental railroad trap here? We very well could be. Uh, one thing I want to do, because you, you refer to, one thing that socialism always does is works with that redistribution of wealth. What I find fascinating is that there are so many entrepreneurs, like Rockefeller started poor in life, his he was from a divorce. I mean, the father left the family. I mean, Andrew Carnegie was the steel entrepreneur, and he came as a migrant uh, from also a very poor family, and he worked for about a, a dime a day uh, in, in his first jobs. I mean, it would be more than that now, maybe $2 a day, but that isn't much. And so you have a lot of people coming in, but they have good ideas. I mean, they're like Edison. They have good ideas, and Henry Ford, who was an orphan, his parents both died, they're starting organizations, too, to help the poor. You got the YMCA started. Uh, they're trying to bring people in and provide opportunities to help them privately. And so, yeah, I think that's the way to go. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm John Harding. I'm from Scotts Valley, just like Taylor just spoke. Um, OK, John, yes. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you, um, for those of us going to school in a place like Scotts Valley, for instance, where they use textbooks that are maybe inaccurate or really biased towards one side. Like, what advice do you have for us to deal with those situations? Well, that's a question I've been dealing with for the last decade, because it, it started with YAF. When I wrote the book, The Myth of the Robber Barons, they said, the United States was a second-rate power after the Civil War, and we become the dominant world leader throughout the 20th century because of what we did in the late 1800s. And yet those people are called robber barons. Matthew Josephson, who wrote the book called The Robber Barons, couldn't be here to promote the book when it reached number one New York Times bestseller in, in the, ultimately in the 1930s because he was in Russia with Stalin promoting communism. Uh, and these people had an ax to grind against free enterprise. The founders thought, hey, freedom is not in your bloodstream. It has to be developed generation to enter to generation. What I don't think they anticipated is there'd be so much pressure on the other side from textbooks by Howard Zinn or robber baron ideas from Matthew Josephson. So at Young America's Foundation, we, uh, they said, hey, Bert, write the myth of the robber barons. That would help with that. I wrote a book, New Deal or Raw Deal, which I'm going to talk about this afternoon. This textbook study is also important because the American pageant is the most widely used high school and uh, college, even college textbook, we think. The numbers on that are difficult to get a firm hand on, but our estimates are that they're on top. Well, so this critique is online. Hey, there's no book to buy or anything here. It's right there online at www.trueamericanhistory.us. So if you're using that book, you can have somebody say, hey, I know the textbook is saying this, but what they're not saying is this, and give you uh, a, a lesson on how freedom works and their recommendations of socialism did not work. And so we have that, uh, that sort of thing that we're doing. I think online are great opportunities. I think campus speeches that YAF does uh, on the college campuses are absolutely marvelous because they let people know there are other ideas out there. And what we find when we send Ben Shapiro and others to campus, next week I'm going to the University of Memphis for Young America's uh, Foundation to speak to their YAF chapter there. 
when we send speakers out on campuses, what happens is they say there's a whole set of ideas we didn't know existed, and many of those students want to come because they say, we never heard this before. All I want is 30 minutes. O often wh what happens is when I was teaching at a secular, not at Hillsdale College, which has, it's a conservative school, but when I was teaching at more typical liberal colleges, I remember one time I had a person who had gone through some of my colleagues and they were totally indoctrinated. And I gave them a couple lectures and they said, wow, I never heard this. And then they went back to my, professor, my colleagues to talk and one of them came in my office like this. It took me the whole afternoon talking with Julie and I still don't have her back in line. And you did it. And I thought, he thought I was going to be, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, internally, I was like, yay, good for Julie. And uh, so all we need is a chance to get those ideas out there. I, uh, what I like with YF, they are getting the ideas out there. Uh, you can help, their Twitter, their social media can be helpful. It's often used by the other side. They're blocking Prager videos, but I have a Prager video on Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller, Prager U videos, that has over 3 million views. And my son was telling me one time, he said, Dad, I was at a conversation and they were all discussing the ideas in your Prager video. You know, because it has three million. Well, we get, Dennis Prager, who speaks sometimes for YAF, is a great guy and he gets the word out with these five minute Prager U videos. Watch many of those Prager U videos. They're very, how many see Prager U videos? I don't need, I'm preaching to the choir. Good for you. That's where you can get good five minute summaries of ideas. That's out there. We have benefited some from social media, even though it's often controlled by the other side. Conservatives can get their ideas out. Thank you for that excellent question. Hi, my name is Ethan Savage. I'm from Granada Hills Charter High School. Yes. I've heard that a rule for the public sector is to go where, where it's too risky for businesses to operate or where they can take a hit, like public airports, which will operate at a loss in order to offer low cost to incentivize business in the area. I'd like to know what your opinion is on that. Yeah, the first airports, you know, the Wright brothers flew the first plane, and the first airport was private right there at Dayton. I'm not completely persuaded by, by that argument. Uh, you know, I'd have to look at the economics, but I'm not persuaded. But I want to say this. There's an implication in your question that there's no role for government. I think there is. For example, national defense. Yeah. I don't think I'd want MX missiles, you know, owned privately too much. I think, th I think that there is a role for government in national defense. There's a role for government in protecting contracts enforcing rule of law and the Constitution. And so I think there's a definite, I mean, that, that, that's quite a bit right there. The, to administer uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., there is a role for government. But when they get into business, the business end of it, which an airport is, that is where historically they've been a disaster. Even the founders thought we needed to have a government for national defense and to conduct foreign policy. I mean, the crazy thing is, when we were in the Mexican War, the reason Nicholas Trist went over to help negotiate the treaty in the Mexican War is because they went through the State Department and said, OK, who here can speak Spanish? And Nicholas Trist raised his hand. Oh, we have one. Good, you're our treaty maker. And so he goes south down there to help make the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican War. My point here being, there is a role for government, but when they get it into the private realm, that's where often disaster occurs. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jack Barth, and I go to Holy Family Catholic High School in Minnesota. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, the New Deal in American history, especially where I live, is Hill started in Minnesota in St. Paul. Yeah, we, we actually learned about him, surprisingly. Was it positive? It, no. <laughs> it is mixed. All he did for St. Paul, and they can't do that. Anyway, go ahead. 
Uh, anyway, they teach the new, they teach the New Deal as that it brought us out of the Great Depression and that it's still helping us today. And I actually had a discussion after class with the teacher about how I think it's actually causing a lot of the problems. And he said, "Yes, but it was worth it to get us out of the uh, the Great Depression." Do you believe that it did help us get out of the Great Depression? You are right. Your teacher is wrong, uh, and I'll talk about that this afternoon. That is the subject of a talk I'm going to do this afternoon. I, I want to address that. Because the Great Depression is the one time when this country almost tilted completely to socialism. And I want to show the results. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Patrick Warren. I'm from Provo, Utah. OK. And I was, I have a we more have Utah people. Hey, the transcontinental came right in your yeah. territory. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Um, I have a more specific question and then a more general question. Sure. Which is, would you say that um, net neutrality has caused monopolies to be created because it, it makes it more difficult? Like, do you think it makes it more difficult for new yeah. internet service providers to pop up? And what do you think about net neutrality just in general? Yeah, I, that's very good. And I, that's one subject that I've realized the more I've gotten into it, I'm going to have to back off and let people who know a lot more than I do about it uh, handle that. But that, that is, you know, th this is a fascinating question. And I know one thing we found is that well, this is one aspect of it. When we try to enforce some kind of equal time provisions, those have been a disaster for conservatives. Talk radio and, uh, began when, in a big way in the late 1980s with Rush Limbaugh when we had the, the Fairness Doctrine was struck down and all of a sudden a network didn't have to automatically be obligated to, to uh, do equal time. So it, it's a complicated issue and I'm going to let, this, you know, it's, there's some issues you let the next generation deal with. And I'm going to let you, your generation deal with that one. Thank you. Yes. We have one last virtual pass question. This is from Dennis Little from St. Augustine, Florida. His question is, in light of recent natural disasters, is government involvement and intervention in recovery and rebuilding a good thing, or should we leave it to the private industry? I like that question. Uh, thank you for that question. It was on government disasters. Should that be private, or should that be government? Right now, it's heavily government. But did you know back in the 1800s, it was private? And what happened was you think, well, can private enterprise actually come through with enough cash or help to offset damages that occur? Because there are advantages, because when you have government, then it's how much money can we get in, and we want to get as much as we can, whether we need all that we're going to get or not. Whereas with private, you can much more say, Okay, we see that you're taken care of. We'll move on to the next community that needs help. So there are advantages with private, but is it big enough? In the 1800s, we found late 1800s is part of the, that era where we look at uh, private own, the private work in charity. We have like the Humane Society starting for animals, animal shelters, and we have the Red Cross begun by Clara Barton to work for natural disasters. A lot of private money went into the Red Cross for natural, natural disasters. Now, my theory today is that if all of the natural disasters were going to be privately funded, that a lot more people would be in the habit of giving and that they, they would be able to, be, to do the job. State aid could help with projects too. We're talking about federal aid. State aid is always legitimate. It's a state right, but we're talking about taxpayer dollars from everybody going to help a local community. Grover Cleveland, who was president in the 1880s, confronted this issue head on when there was a famine in Texas. That famine in Texas created a need, starving farmers and they requested and we passed a bill in Congress to give ten, just $10,000 to seed to the farmers to help them plant crops for next year because they lost their crops. What happened was Cleveland vetoed it. And I mean, there were people who said, you heartless person vetoing that bill for seed for these starving farmers. And Cleveland said, first of all, I don't think $10,000 is enough. Second, it's not a function according to the Constitution of the federal government. It's a private function. So here, I'd like to make a contribution to help those farmers in East Texas. Other people joined in, 
And the Louisville uh, newspaper, the, what's now the Courier Journal, uh, helped. Other newspapers raised money. $100,000 of private money, 10 times more than was requested under the federal, was given to East Texas to help get them out of that. The Americans are giving people. And with the government now involved, people don't tend to give much anymore because they think, oh, government's doing it. If we were accustomed to solving these kinds of problems ourselves, I suspect, given the pat our track record, that we would have private contributions coming in. People like John D. Rockefeller, who gave away $500 million when he was the only person in the nation who even owned more than $500 million, and he gave that much away to charitable giving. You would have people who would come in and be of help. We don't know that because history didn't go in that direction. Now we have federal bailouts for uh, natural disasters. But I'm just saying, in the late 1800s and throughout most of our history, we've done it privately, and it seemed to work very well. Thank you for that good question.